The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, are you being lied to? They're simply there to put forth a narrative. The media isn't telling you the whole truth. How can you fight back against fake news? They're pulling strings on nearly every form of information that crosses our path in daily lives. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club and Merry Christmas to all. Well, we're just one step away. That's how close the U.S. is to approving a vaccine in the fight against the coronavirus. And Americans could be just days away from receiving the first doses. Every 30 seconds, someone dies from COVID-19. So why are only half of American surveys saying they're willing to take the shot? Caitlin Burke has the story. One of the most critical moments in the fight against COVID-19 happened late Thursday afternoon over a Zoom call. We do have a favorable vote. That vote endorsing widespread use of Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine and putting the U.S. only one step away from an epic vaccination campaign against the virus that's killed more than 300,000 Americans. We really want to treat this vaccine as the liquid gold that it is because it's, it's really the only tool that we have right now in our toolbox to, to cure this disease. Next, it goes to the full FDA for authorization. And then within 24 hours, Pfizer will send out the first 2.9 million doses. We can act quickly and we uh, intend to. We understand the urgency of the situation. We want to make sure we make the absolute best decision for the American people. The Pfizer vaccine was found to be 95% effective with no serious side effects. The first doses will go to healthcare workers and nursing home residents. Personally, I cannot roll up my sleeve fast enough to get this vaccination. A pivotal moment happening as the U.S. reaches another grim milestone, over 3,000 deaths in a single day. That's a reported fatality from the virus every 30 seconds. People still don't think this is a big deal. They think it's kind of fake news. It's not. It's real. The numbers are absolutely real. But many Americans still have questions about the vaccines, with only about half saying in a new Associated Press poll that they're ready to take the shot. Pfizer says it can have 25 million doses of the vaccine for the U.S. by the end of December, and it likely won't be the only option for long. Officials are hopeful we'll have FDA authorization for vaccines from Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson as well, as health experts hope these medications will finally defeat the outbreak. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, this is something we've prayed for. We've prayed for medical breakthroughs. We've prayed for doctors, for scientists to have the insight uh, in order to come up with a vaccine. And now they have. And this one's based on some unusual new technology having to do with the manufacture of RNA. And so it's mimicking uh, the virus and then providing an immune response. Uh, and so I applaud this. This is a wonderful thing, a wonderful development. If you're at risk, and if you don't know if you're at risk, you're probably not, but if you are at risk, I would encourage you, please get uh, a vaccine. There's all kinds of rumors on the Internet that somehow or other there's going to be a microchip in injected into you. Um, this particular vaccine from Pfizer doesn't contain any fetal tissue at all. So all of the internet objections, uh, if you're at risk, it would be much better for you to take whatever risk are associated with a new vaccine than to actually get the virus. If you get the virus and you're at, at risk, you face death. Uh, if you get the vaccine, you're now going to be 95% protected against that. That, in my opinion, is a good risk to take. In other news, the Texas lawsuit challenging the election results in four swing states is now gaining some support. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. 106 Republicans in Congress and multiple state attorneys general are now supporting that lawsuit, with six states asking the Supreme Court to let them join the Texas case as parties to the suit. It says government officials in four swing states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, and Wisconsin, violated the Constitution by changing election procedures, something they say that state legislatures are supposed to do. 
Those four states fired back at the suit Thursday, with Pennsylvania calling the case a meritless abuse of the judicial process. And multiple legal analysts believe it is a long shot. Even so, many Republicans are urging the Supreme Court to hear the case. Well, in Georgia, early voting for the state Senate runoffs begins soon. Voters there determining not only who will fill Georgia's two Senate seats, but also deciding who will control the Senate itself and the balance of power right here in Washington. CBN's Eric Phillips traveled to Georgia to cover the campaign. The stakes are so incredibly high and millions are being spent on both sides to get out the vote for the January 5th runoff election. But how should Christians view it? There are differing perspectives even within the body of Christ. It's very important because unless something changes, we're staring down the barrel of a Joe Biden presidency. I think for believers, it means everything. I think we have to make sure that our voting is rooted in the values of the gospel. No matter who you ask, the consensus is the Senate runoff election in Georgia is pivotal, especially for Christians. Ralph Reed heads the conservative Atlanta-based Faith and Freedom Coalition. He says They've Christians are called by God for such a time as this. And he has placed us in the United States right now at this hour to be faithful witnesses to his glory and his goodness. Reed says he wants to use the massive voting strength of evangelicals to tip the scales in favor of Republican senators Kelly Leffler and David Perdue because of what's at stake if the other side wins, including Israel's sovereignty. Massive tax increases to gut the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which protects our First Amendment right to freedom of religion. Raphael Warnock uh, is pro-abortion. He says that abortion on demand is entirely consistent with his view as a Christian minister. I don't know how you can support an agenda that extreme. I always fight for their right to be wrong. Reverend Billy Honor is a faith organizer in Georgia and has been pushing voters, particularly in historically marginalized communities, to engage by mail since 2018, when Democrat Stacey Abrams narrowly lost her bid for governor to Republican Brian Kemp. I'm a gospel-centered. Uh, type of civic minded person. I've always said that, but, but mine is actually rooted in the gospel. And that is the gospel of Luke where he says that Jesus, I've come to open up the prison to those that are bound. Jesus says, I've come to say to all of them that this is your time. Honor agrees Christians are called to action, but differs on what that means. Who's wanting to open up hospitals in rural communities and who's wanting to close them? Right. Who's wanting to expand access to health care and who's wanting to reduce it? Right. Who's wanting to expand access to unemployment insurance during this time of pandemic and who wants to foreclose on it? He says all people of faith, even Christians, won't vote the same way. A point Reed acknowledges as well. But both are working hard to make sure believers get to the polls. She got one more vote, you know, that the job isn't done yet. And I pray for us to continue to be found faithful. Ralph Reed said the upcoming runoff election is not one of persuasion, but one of participation. In other words, whichever side gets more of its base to the polls will likely win. And no matter how you slice it, Christians make up a crucial part of the voting bloc. In Atlanta, Georgia, Eric Phillips, CBN News. All right, thank you, Eric. Well, turning overseas, Morocco is the latest Arab country to agree to normalize diplomatic relations with Israel. President Trump making that announcement yesterday. The North African country becomes the fourth Arab nation in four months to make the move, all as a part of Trump's, uh, the Trump administration's Abraham Accords. The White House says the agreement will expand economic and cultural cooperation and advance stability in the region. Well, since the signing of the Abraham Accords between Israel and Arab nations, many have speculated Saudi Arabia might follow suit. But as CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, there are other factors at play. Just this past week, a Saudi prince unexpectedly blasted Israel during a security conference in Bahrain in a session ironically titled New Security Partnerships in the Middle East. They profess that they want to be friends with Saudi Arabia. And yet, all Israeli governments are the last of the Western colonizing powers of the Middle East. From the time of the Balfour Declaration, they have forcibly evicted the inhabitants of Palestine after the 1948 war 
Israeli Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi spoke by video after the prince. I would like to express my regret on the comments of the Saudi representative, the foreign minister. I don't believe that uh, they reflect the spirit and the changes uh, taking place in the Middle East. The real question then is, does that say that the whole kingdom of Saudi Arabia has an attitude problem, or does it say that this guy has an attitude problem? Former Israeli U.N. Ambassador Dory Gold also attended that conference, witnessing the prince's accusations. I think he was being used by the highest authorities in Saudi Arabia to put some distance between us and them. Gold tells CBN News the attitude toward Israelis appeared very warm, except for the prince. Gold believes Saudi Arabia could still come around, mainly because they have a common enemy. I think it's the Iranian factor which gave birth to the Israeli-Arab peace process as we know it today. Danny Danone, another former UN ambassador, tells CBN News he believes the Saudis will eventually join the Abraham Accords. They are the most important one for the region, for Israel, and they understand that once they will normalize the relations with Israel, we will see much more stability in the region. And it will be a, a major force to block the hostility coming from Iran. Gold points to Washington as being the major part of this puzzle. And what happens next? If they hear from Washington, we like the Abraham Accords, we want more treaties between Israel and its neighbors, great. Gold says while the Trump administration has improved the connection between Saudi Arabia and Israel, which led to opening its airspace to Israeli planes, it could all change if a Biden administration were to take a different approach. But if, on the other hand, they uh, don't acknowledge that, they say, no, you want to improve the Middle East environment, you know, give the Palestinians more money and make the Palestinians the center of everything, that will not move us very far along. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Gordon, how much does the prince's comments pour cold water on the warming relations with Israel? Well, I hope it doesn't pour any cold water because factually it's just wrong. What he said is not the historical record. Here's the historical record. Uh, the League of Nations got together because they won World War I. In, in winning World War I, the Ottoman Empire was dissolved. And so countries were created. Iraq was created. Saudi Arabia was created. Uh, Syria, Lebanon, and the Palestinians were put into a special British mandate. In that mandate, the League of Nations at the San Remo Conference said, we need to establish a Jewish homeland and a Jewish state in the former lands owned by the Ottoman Empire. And that was the whole purpose of the British mandate. The Palestinians, the, uh, it's a mistake to call them that because they didn't even call themselves that way back in the 1920s. They were Arabs. They were ethnic Arabs who had been brought in by uh, the Ottomans uh, to work their land. And they didn't own the land. The Ottomans did. Uh, so the, the, they steadfastly resisted a Jewish state and did so for pure reasons of anti-Semitism. To say that they were forcibly evicted is, again, an historical lie. When the, British, when the, the, the Israeli state was announced in 1948, the Arab nations surrounding Israel all declared war against her, and they said to the Arab inhabitants, please evacuate because we don't want you to be a casualty in the war. When we win the war, you can move back. So to say it's a forcible eviction is, again, it's not part of the historical record at all. Uh, I'm really getting tired of the revisionist history. We also see the same revisionist history in President Obama's memoirs, where he's talking about a British occupation. It wasn't a British occupation at all. This was all established by international law. It was all established by the League of Nations and the UN specifically when it was formed after another world war, World War II. It adopted all of the policies of the League of Nations. So this is established international law. Israel has a right to exist. And it's high time for all the neighboring states to recognize that right. Now, we've got something that's happened under the um, current administration, under, under the Trump administration. It's a radical move 
we're no longer going to focus solely on the Palestinian problem. We're going to go around it, and we're going to establish peace with each individual state and create a, a new block and a new alliance within the Middle East. It's an absolute brilliant stroke. Under Secretary of State John Kerry, he said, no, you can't do that. You can't have individual peace. You have to first solve the Palestinian problem. Well, when you look at the world that way, you, you end up with an insolvable problem because the Palestinians never want to solve the problem. They don't want a two-state solution. They do not want peace. And this has been the reality for 100 years now. Let's wake up to the reality. They want to drive Israel into the sea. They teach their children that. They reward people who kill Jews. Uh, they reward them based on the severity of the sentence that they receive in Israel for acts of terror. When you look at it from this point of view, our foreign policy on this has been absolutely nuts and has been that way for decades. It's so refreshing to find someone that says, no, this isn't the way anymore. And by all means, we're, the American taxpayer isn't going to pay for this. And so we're going to stop paying the Palestinian Authority and we're going to stop paying UNRWA. Well, elections have consequences. And here's some consequences that we should be looking at. Number one, Biden has already said he's going to reinstitute payments to the Palestinian Authority and to UNRWA. Uh, I, I find that absolutely unbelievable. Legally, he's going to have a problem because of the Taylor Force Act and because of another terrorism act that was passed in 2018. So he's going to face legal challenges to this because if any of the money goes to those terrorists, he's got a big problem. Here's the second problem. Uh, he's been encouraged to reactivate uh, the Iranian treaty on its current uh, level with no renegotiation. Uh, I find this absolutely incredible that we would try to bring this back up after it's so plain that they're trying to develop a nuclear weapon and they were using that treaty as a cover for it. Uh, this is incredible. For, for Iran to get a nuclear weapon is unbelievable, uh, completely destabilizing to the region. And that's one of the keys to the Abraham Accords. It's trying to create an alliance against Iran and Iran's aggression, which has been evident. Uh, they launched drone attacks against the uh, refineries in Saudi Arabia. They've used proxies against our own troops in Iraq. They have been funding Hamas and other terror groups for decades. Uh, they are the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world today. Now, here's something that just happened. Rep Representative Gregory Meeks, he's the incoming head chair of the House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee. This man has real power. He wrote a letter to Biden saying, please reinstitute the Iranian treaty without any renegotiation. I find it incredible that a congressman with that kind of authority and that kind of information would write that letter. But that's what we're facing. That's what we're looking at. I hope the Biden administration, I hope the incoming Secretary of State, I hope they all wake up to this and say uh, uh, nuclear Iran is a, is a non-starter for us. Let's go forward with the Abraham Accords. Let's not make the Palestinian Authority the deciding issue in the Middle East. Let's create coalitions to come against what is a quite clearly uh, an aggressive power using terrorism, using drones. If they get nuclear weapons, the game's over. Terry? Well, still ahead, stabbing pain in his side. This man had a cyst on his kidney. See how he was supernaturally healed in an instant. And up next, media malpractice, and it may have cost President Trump the election. How has fake news distorted reality? And can we stop it? One insider reveals the answers after this. Uh, print and broadcast journalists, comedians, and other entertainers, they all put their own slant on the news. 
media bias has been a law around as long as there's been media. So what's new? It's now risen to a level so pervasive it may have swayed the outcome of the election. Gary Lane has the story. In this era of fake news and social media censorship, Americans are showing little trust in mainstream media. A Gallup poll taken just prior to the election found that only 9% of those questioned trust the media a great deal. One third, 33% said they don't trust the media at all. Cheryl Atkinson is a veteran journalist, former CBS investigative reporter, and host of the Sunday morning program, Full Measure. Her new book is Slanted, How the News Media Taught Us to Love Censorship and Hate Journalism. They're simply there to put forth a narrative. They're not acting as news as we once knew it or as journalists as we traditionally understood them to be. They're simply trying to forward certain political or corporate interests. Research psychologist Dr. Robert Epstein believes Google helped shift a minimum of 6 million votes in the 2020 election. The former Psychology Today editor-in-chief says the big tech giant did it by manipulating search results to favor Democrats. Atkinson believes big media influenced the election outcome by playing what she calls the substitution game. When you know that but for the name being changed to a different party, something would be handled entirely differently. You know that there's a narrative at play or there's somebody trying to manipulate an outcome or public opinion. And I like to ask the question when it comes to the election, how would it have been covered if not for the narrative? How would this have been covered if journalists had, had approached this from a neutral standpoint? And I think you have a whole different landscape if that had been the case, both building up to this election and what's happened since. Conservatives argue that Donald Trump's presidency would have proceeded differently had the media not obsessed over Russian campaign collusion. Robert Mueller's two-year $32 million investigation put the allegations to rest. But few journalists offered apologies or corrections for false reporting. This was all mission accomplished on their part. They were not trying to disseminate the actual facts. They were trying to create this air of controversy and chaos for the couple of years that they did. And when it didn't turn out to be true in the end, as perhaps some of them knew all along, they still had accomplished their goal, in my view. Also, journalists who challenge the dominant media narrative are often ostracized or censored by big tech media. The New York Times labeled Atkinson and others coronavirus doubters for their initial reporting of the COVID-19 virus. Who knows why they decided to pull certain people out and try to controversialize them so people wouldn't listen to our reporting. I only knew it was completely false. Had to hire a lawyer because the New York Times would not take down the false information and we finally forced corrections that of course probably almost nobody saw. But this shows you that there is a big deep narrative at play and the New York Times was really on that train from the start. Print and broadcast journalists aren't the only ones showing bias. Atkinson says comedians and entertainers also put their unique slant on the news. Strings are being pulled by these, I call them smear artists, and some of them have done interviews with me. They're not just pulling strings on the news and on social media in these very obvious ways and outrageous ways. They're pulling strings on nearly every form of information that crosses our path in daily lives. So how should news consumers respond as American colleges and universities? crank out a new breed of political advocates rather than unbiased journalists. Whether it's news about COVID-19, an uncertain election, or other issues, Atkinson says people need to reject biased reporting and the stigma that comes from expressing alternate views. When they're trying to make you think that you're the only one who has some crazy view and you're not supposed to think it, you're not supposed to believe that scientific study, whatever it is, know that that's not true. They only win the propagandists if you live your life inside the box that I call the internet and social media and the news, make sure you have this reality check, listen to your cognitive dissonance, listen to your friends and neighbors, and live in the world as it exists, not the one they're trying to create, not this artificial reality. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, the name of the book is Slanted, How the News Media Taught Us to Love Censorship and Hate Journalism. And you can buy it wherever books are sold. And let me underline, if you want to get away from fake news, get the CBN News app. It's available where you can have a 24-hour news channel on your television if you have a Roku or Apple TV or Smart TV or Amazon Fire. There's a bunch of different ways. But you can also download it on your smartphone, on a tablet. You can get notifications. You can also sign up for our newsletter. So the, the, the CBN News will be in your news feed, on, your, on, on emails. 
get informed, stay informed, and realize there's a whole lot of bias out there. Terry? Well, up next, searing pain. Put a kink in this man's golf game. Doctors prescribe pain meds, but they just took the edge off. So how did this golfer get his swing back? And why was he more shocked than anyone? He's gonna tell you himself after this. A stabbing pain on his right side. That's what Joe felt every time he bent down or twisted. And it totally spoiled his golf game and some other things in his life. How did he get back on the links pain-free? Well, take a look. Joe Eterno has a long history with the 700 Club. It started back in 1976 when he prayed for salvation with Pat Robertson. As I completed the prayer, it was like a lightning bolt went through my body. It was like as if I stuck my finger into a ele electric socket. I still didn't know what to do with my life. God just brought people into my life as I needed them to, to keep, me, keep me on the path. Joe grew in his faith over the years. Pat Robertson's teachings and the 700 Club were a great source of encouragement to him. I tune in daily to watch the 700 Club. I find it very inspirational. Uh, I, I enjoy the stories. I enjoy the uh, uh, the word of knowledge that comes through uh, the show. But he never imagined he'd have a personal experience with a word of knowledge. In January of 2019, Joe started experiencing severe pain in his right side. Mostly in the morning when I would get out of bed and I would go to bend down to put my socks on or put my shoes on or twist any kind of twisting, go to pick something up, and I would feel that, that uh, stabbing pain on my right side. Joe went to his doctor who ordered a sonogram. It revealed a small benign cyst on his right kidney, which was painful but was diagnosed as being harmless. Joe's doctor simply prescribed pain meds. I don't abuse it, so I was just doing it once a day, one 800 milligram ibuprofen and but consistently every day every day every day as a retiree joe enjoys playing golf to relax the pain was making it difficult to enjoy anything it annoyed me a lot N not so much with the swing but getting the ball picking the ball up out of the cup uh, any kind of bending in the in the midsection area uh, i would feel that that pain he thought about praying for healing but felt the pain was just part of getting old God's got bigger issues to deal with. You know, why would I want to bring this little pain in, in my side up to, up to God? You know, it's just, uh, it's just something I felt that, I, you know, I should just deal with it. Then one morning in June, Joe was watching the 700 Club. He was on his way in from getting his second cup of coffee when he heard Gordon say, Someone else with problems with your right kidney and uh, extraordinary pain, infection, kidney stones. God is healing all of it right now. In Jesus' name, receive it. I put my hand immediately on my, on my side and pressed against my right side and, and prayed along with Gordon. To Joe's surprise, the pain disappeared immediately. I was in awe when this happened because you, you're used to watching the 700 Club and you see it happen to somebody else. But until it happens to you, it, it just strengthens your your faith. It's like this really, this really can be done. God, get, God's working in my life. He's there. He's listening. He hears me. He knows about me. There's just no doubt in my mind, you know, that God is awesome. Today he is back having fun on the links and loves sharing his miracle with others who need healing in their lives. That's the unconditional love that God has for you. You're his child. He wants you to have a good life. He wants you to enjoy your time here. And I, I don't believe God wants you to suffer. God doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't. He wants you to be in health. He wants your, 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 everything concerning you to prosper just as your soul prospers. That is his will. When you get it, when you understand it, 
wonderful things start to happen. Now, for Joe, he's sitting there thinking, well, God's got other things to do. You know, God's not concerned about me. Well, Joe's wrong. God's very concerned. And if you think that, hear me clearly, you're wrong. He is infinitely concerned about you. He loves you so much that he was willing to die for you. The whole purpose of creation, everything, is for you. Isn't that amazing? The one who laid out the heavens and spoke everything into being, as he's doing it, he's thinking about you. He's actively planning for you. He is creating good things for you to walk into. He's creating things that will satisfy the desire of your soul. He provided salvation for you before you ever sinned. He provided healing. He provided his presence. He never wanted us to be away from him. He wanted to come down in the cool of the evening and talk with us. That was his dream. That's why he created everything. And he hasn't given up on his dream. He still wants that with you. He still wants it. He still says, don't worry, I'm coming through. I'm breaking through for you. I, I've died for you by, your, by my stripes, you're healed. I, I'll take care of everything. I'll give you a new heart, a new body, a new life, a new spirit. I'll do it all for you. Isn't that wonderful? That's good news. That's the best news everyone has ever heard. Now, we're going to pray that the good news would come to you that the realization would come, that with that realization, the word would be made flesh in you. And here's the word. He forgives all your iniquities and he heals all your diseases. What a wonderful word. That word become, can become flesh in your body. All you have to do is believe it. So believe it. God's created all of this so that you would believe it. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. The Bible says when two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done. So before we pray, we want to encourage you. We've got some other miracles that have happened. Here's Chris. He wrote in and said, for years I had a lot of pain over my entire body every night. Many times I couldn't sleep because of it. My entire body would hurt, especially when I got up in the night or in the morning. I was watching the 700 Club, Terry calling out several healings, when she said something, someone has pain all over their body when they get up out of bed. The Lord is healing that right now. Well, I knew it was for me. I've been pain-free ever since and praising God. Well, this is Susan Gordon. On November 25th, the testimony was being read about healing of migraines. She says, as I listened, I said, I wish I could have that. I was on my fourth day of pounding in my head, burning and pain in my neck. I no sooner said that, laid down, and the pain disappeared. Gordon, you had a word of knowledge saying, Susan, you are having migraines. God is healing you, and they will never return. I burst into tears knowing this was for me. Funny thing, I missed the live episode and didn't watch until until later that night on the internet. Nothing is impossible. God is amazing and truly loves us. Wow. God's word is timeless. You know, that scripture I just quoted to you was written 3,000 years ago. Mm. It's timeless. Jesus said, my words are life and they are spirit. Let them be life and let them be spirit to you right now. Lord, we lift everyone in the audience, everyone who is having pain, and in an act of faith, we join with them. And as they lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing, we come into agreement with them. We say over them, be healed, be set free from all pain. May you prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord for what you have done what you are doing and what you're about to do because you work everything together for our good. Lord, we love you. We're called according to your purpose and your purpose is to have fellowship with us. 
we love you that you've called us. So we say, here we are. Lord, could you heal our disease? Could you touch us now? And be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. There's a woman, your name is Louise. You've got pain in your left kidney. You saw the story about the right kidney. And Louise, God is calling you by name. He is healing your left kidney right now. It's going to be restored. No more pain, no more suffering for you in Jesus' name. Terry? Mm -hmm. There's someone or numbers of people who you're having trouble getting an um, adequate oxygen supply. Just the, the capacity of your lungs for whatever reason is low. God is healing that condition for you. You're going to be able to just take a deep breath now like you haven't been able to do in a long time and just release that as God brings all of that into order in your body. And someone else, you have an issue it's like a skin issue, but it's especially bad on your hands. In fact, you wear gloves sometimes to cover it because you're humiliated by it. God is creating that. Your skin is going to be as clear and as beautiful as a newborn baby's. Uh, there's someone you've got recurring sinus infections, and nothing seems to be working for you. You've tried everything, everything over the counter, uh, all kinds of um, nasal washes, all this, all this. God is healing it. And he's giving you a brand new immune system and, and, and all of this is, is going to leave and be restored now. That pain just left your forehead. In Jesus' name, be healed. Yeah, and there's somebody with a rotator cuff issue. It's not, it's not torn exactly, but it's just very, very sore. Especially, you know, when you move your arm around or you try to lift anything above the height of your shoulder, God is healing that for you. You're just going to feel a warmth come into that part of your, your shoulder, and it's, it's just being all put back in place in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you want fellowship with us. This is amazing. You want to talk with us. You want to be with us. So we thank you for that. We praise you for all that you've done for us. Thank in you. Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Call us 1-800-700-7000, or you can email us like Chris did. You can let us know your good report and what God has done for you. And if you need prayer, we're here for you seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that doesn't give up, but gets an answer. 1-800-700-7000. Tara? Well, still ahead, her blog is named God Cake, and fans have eaten it up. Nina Keegan now has her own inspirational talk show. She joins us live to talk about her new book, 100 Days with God. Plus, cutbacks, layoffs, losing everything. One entrepreneur was on the brink of disaster after his biggest client canceled all of his contracts. So how did his business not only survive, but thrive? Stay tuned, you'll find out. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Seven U.S. Air Force basic trainees marched into history, becoming the first enlisted members of the United States Space Force. The trainees graduated at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland and will transfer to an Air Force base in California to begin their training for their new positions, learning how to operate satellites and radio stations. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is providing essential food for those in need during the COVID pandemic. Leah, an elderly widow in Kenya, cares for her four grandchildren all by herself. The odd job she worked to earn money for food disappeared when the COVID lockdowns came, leaving her empty handed. With tears rolling down her cheeks, she told Operation Blessing staff, I cry every time I have nothing to give to these children. They completely depend on me to provide their food, yet I am old and weak. Things looked hopeless, but thanks to its partners, Operation Blessing provided an entire month's worth of food she was, of course, overjoyed, saying it means a lot to me because my grandchildren will have food to eat. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this.
Superbook fans, today we have a special treat for you to watch on the Superbook Bible app. It's Ask Gizmo, a 15-minute question and answer session with Superbook's lovable robot, Gizmo. Just open the Superbook Bible app on your phone or your tablet and click on the videos section to watch Ask Gizmo. Gizmo will be answering several questions that were submitted to him on Facebook and will be sharing how kids can have their own questions answered directly by him. The Superbook Bible app is free and it's available to download in the App Store or Google Play. So be sure to check out Ask Gizmo today. All right. Well, Steve and Lucy Newton lost their biggest client. So their finances took a huge hit. Even though money was tight, the Newtons decided that giving was the only way forward. And within two weeks, their decision paid off big time. Steve and Lucy Newton enjoy being able to spend time with their grandchildren. They've been married for over 40 years, and from the early days of their marriage, they learned about the importance of giving. What we learned was out of Malachi, that um, bring your tithe to the storehouse to make sure that there would be provision there. But that wasn't the, the reason we gave. We gave out of an obedience in our heart because, because of our love for God. Initially, your thought process is this is crazy. You know, what are we doing here, giving money away? And then you go to the Word and you say that shows you specifically, this is a tenth of what you're to give. This is God's. Lucy was a hairdresser and Steve worked in sales. Though they were paid on commission, they never wavered in their tithe. I tithed on the commission and I also tithed on my gratuities. Everything was income. So I tithed on everything that I got. God showed His faithfulness in providing the clients. They came, and it grew. Every month, I was at the very top of the sales list, like month after month after month after month. In 1981, the Newtons became CBN partners. We saw CBN particularly uh, as a significant ministry and a place where we could put our resources. It felt very good about it. I know that nothing's being wasted here. I knew that the resources that we put into CBN was good ground, and we saw the increase, we saw the growth, uh, we saw that they were reaching millions and millions of people for Christ. In 1995, Steve left his sales job and started a media production company. For a while, business was running smoothly, until his biggest client canceled all of their contracts. And within a very short period of time, I was just left with, you know, hanging out there and uh, you know, concerned, se severely concerned about our revenue share. Their finances were tight, but the Newtons only saw one way out, continue to trust God and remain faithful in their giving. It's like uh, if God was good to me back here when things were going well and God will still be good to you here in this situation in the valley, then why stop? And so we never did. The Newtons paid their tithe. Two weeks later, Steve got a call phone call says, would you be interested in brokering some time on a station, a big station in New York City? The station was, it was an hour a day, Monday through Friday, and it was $10,000 per half hour. When he asked me that question, I said, would I? I'd <laughs> be, absolutely. And God, you know, it was amazing. Steve and Lucy's business continued to grow and prosper. They know it's because of their faithfulness in giving. And today they continue to tithe faithfully to their church as well as partner with CBN. When you give, you see that God blesses that gift. And then in return, he's blessing us. We all have this heart for caring for people and caring for what God wants to do and bringing his kingdom into reality here and into the lives of people. Well, this is how we can do it by making it possible for a ministry such as CBN to work it, to do it, to present it to so many, not just locally, but around the world. Let Steve and Lucy's story encourage you, even when you're facing very uncertain times and, and it, you know, where's all this going to come from? Put your trust in God and just obey the words of Jesus. Give and it will be given unto you. 
If you want to do that, call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. Some of you can give at $40 a month, that's 700 Club Gold. We also have a 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year, that's $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and join, you'll get the wonderful teaching, the name of God. I want you to have it. It's yours when you become a member. So call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, are you living with fear and anxiety, maybe even having panic attacks? For years, Nina Keegan battled all three, but not anymore. So what made all the difference? Take a look. Nina Keegan is the co-host of the TV and YouTube program, Grace Grace. The show seeks to draw viewers to God through discussion of the Bible and relevant guests. And the power of life and death are in our tongue. Speak life, that's what the Bible says. Nina is also the author of a new devotional book, 100 Days with God. Through hope-filled, scripture-based writings, she aims to connect us more deeply to the Lord. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Nina Keegan. Nina, it's great to have you with us today. Hi, Terry. Thank you so much for having me on. I love CBN, and I am just absolutely thrilled to be on here with you today. Well, Such a then, when you. someone looks at you, I mean, you're you're smart, you're beautiful, you're successful, and yet you say that there was fear and anxiety dominating your life at one point. Why? What was it? Well, looking back, really fear is just an absence of being able to trust God. It really is an identity crisis. It's really just not knowing who you are in Christ because we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And when we really get that revelation, then there's nothing we can do th that we cannot do because God is so with us and for us and he has a plan. But when we fail to recognize that final deliverance that we have through the righteousness of God in Christ, we can walk in all kinds of fear and anxiety and panic. But for me, it was just understanding and knowing that God would not talk to me that way, that that the, the voices of fear and anxiety and that, you know, I, I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop was just really not not trusting God. It was really just that absence of that and then understanding and knowing that the word says differently and that I got a hold of all of the promises about fear and anxiety. There are 365 of them. That is one for every day. And that in and of itself is astonishing. God does not want us to fear. And when I started speaking those over my life, instead of what the enemy was saying to me, it was just a powerful revelation for me. You have a highly successful blog. You named it God Cake. How did that happen and how did it lead to your talk show? Well, it, it's kind of funny because years and years ago, God told me uh, that I was going to be an end time harvester for the kingdom of heaven. And he gave me a vision and I didn't even really know what that was or what that meant. And he showed me this grapevine basket full of grapes and then I was like, that's a lot of grapes. And he <laughs> said, look out. And I saw vineyards. And I was teaching a little Bible study in my neighborhood. I had no idea what God had in store for me. But I was running one day and I felt like the Lord told me I needed to write a blog, which made zero sense because I had never even read a blog. So I was totally out of my comfort zone, but I knew that wasn't my notion. That is nothing I would have ever come up with on my own. And when he gave me the name God Cake, um, and it made me just kind of laugh because, you know, God was feeding the Israelites manna from heaven, but he really just wants to give us cake. He wants to give us everything good and sweet and kind. And, you know, sometimes we're just scraping by and mm -hmm. he really just wants to give us all that he has for us. And when we just amen, God, just say yes. You can do things that you never even dreamed or imagined You're because it's really about him. Your new book is called 100 Days with God. Want to be sure we get that in. You've been starting your day with God for a long time. How has that changed your life? Oh, it's everything. You know, when we just give God our ear in the morning and we ask him to order our steps for the day, the day just goes so much better than we could ever ask or imagine. It's really just about seeking him first and asking him what he has in store 
for the day and that he would direct and order every steps and just protect and guide us and lead us through the day. So it's it's really about just devoting that morning time, that first first time of the day with him. You know, we live in a time where pe people are feeling anxious, they're feeling concern. One of your favorite devotionals is called Happiness is a Choice. Talk about that. Well, I believe that, you know, it's like a glass is half full, half empty kind of thing. I believe we get to choose. You know, you know, you might not have the best or the happiest day every day, but there's going to be something happy in that day. If you can pick one thing, even that you just had a good lunch that day, if you could just focus and redirect your attention on the good and find that happiness, because you know, the joy of the Lord is our strength and we can become unhappy, but we can't become unjoyed because that comes <laughs> from God. And so, you know, we, we, we need that. We need that for strength. And so it really is just like you're going to make a decision that you're going to be happy no matter what the circumstances are around you. You cast your cares and let him do the heavy lifting. That's just one of the nuggets, friends, that you will find in Nina's devotional called 100 Days with God. We could all use encouragement during these tough times, so get a copy for yourself. It makes a great Christmas gift, but it's wonderful to start your day with every day. Nina, thank you. Great to have you here. By the thank way, it's available so much. wherever books are sold. Merry Christmas, Nina. Merry Christmas. God bless you, Terry. You too. Great. Here's a word from Isaiah. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.